This is the Inquisitive Minds Podcast. Hey, thank you for tuning in to the Inquisitive Minds Podcast. I'm your host, as usual, Johnny Smith. Uh, with me today, I have another guest that is a grantee of the Steel City Arts Foundation, all the way from Los Angeles. Please welcome to the program, Caroline Hawthorne. Hello, everybody. Thank Do you, you know how much <laughs> I had to consciously think about your name? <laughs> no, like it's amazing because it's a relatively simple name, but people mess it up all the time. Like they call me Catherine, or the big one is Carolyn. Carolyn. Okay. Carolyn. No, um, when I used to work with kids, fun fact, I still work with kids. Um, I used to tell them, everybody get into the Caroline. Uh, the Caroline. Okay. Yes. Uh-huh. So you are a stand-up comedian. Yep. Uh, out of Los Angeles. Mm-hmm. Uh, born and raised? Born and raised in LA, yeah. Oh, boy. Yeah. That, that feels intimidating. Oh, no, no it's funny because many people say no one's born in LA. They, they move from their small town and go to LA, but no... Um, I was born and raised in L.A., yeah. For what it's worth, and I mean this as a compliment, Uh you don't give off the, or what I would think is the stereotypical person from L.A. vibe. Oh, no. I mean, I think it's, there's actually a lot of diversity and a lot of interesting stuff happening in L.A., in my humble opinion. The true assholes of L.A. are the ones who never worked, who like move from their small town, never dealt with their own stuff. Mm. And they think I'm going to go to L.A. and it's going to fix everything. That's not the case. Also, my parents, my mother specifically is from New York. She was born and raised in Canarsie. Mm -hmm. And um, many people are like, oh, you have a slight New York accent. And I'm like, yeah, that's because my mother, she never got... She's like, I don't have a New York accent. She absolutely does. Um, It's just not as stereotypical as you would think it is. Okay. So... I so I very much inhabit a lot of her mannerisms. Okay. Uh huh. That's fair. You got into performing early. Yeah, I've been. Yeah, we were just talking about this before the podcast started. I've been um, singing and acting since I was six. So that's always been a passion of yours. Yeah, it's always been the passion. I mean, like I know many people are like, "What's the moment you knew you wanted to be an actor or performer?" I never really had that moment. It just felt like it was something that I always needed to do. Okay, mm-hmm. that's interesting. Now, yeah. when did you uh, branch out to comedy? It's very fu- Kevin, who's another grantee. He warned me that this was going to be a question because, like, so many stand-up comedians, they have like the most tragic, incredible backstories. Like, they've dealt with such hardships, and stand-up saved them. That is not at all my story. <laughs> that is not at all okay. it. Um, I was a sophomore in college, and I always knew that I was funny. Like. I always felt being funny was something I was naturally good at. And I was in my sophomore year of college getting a BFA in acting. And I was feeling very isolated. I wasn't entirely sure what to do with myself. I had a teacher who said, yeah, you're a very unique type. So it's going to be a lot harder for you. A very unique type. A very unique type. Like in acting specifically, but in comedy in many art forms anyway. Like people are like, this is what you're going to be good at. These, these are the kinds of roles we picture for you. But I've often compared myself to Gonzo from The Muppets because nobody knows what I am. Exactly. Um, you know, real quick, to make a point of that, uh, uh-huh. there was there was a profound thought I had about yes. you. Yes. Uh-huh. In, in one part in your act, uh, you said something about being Jewish. Yeah. Uh-huh. And then you're like, of course I'm Jewish. Look at me. <laughs> and I've heard like uh-huh. Jewish people uh, mm-hmm. say similar things of that nature. Yeah. And I feel like, and, and I don't mean this in, a, in an insulting way at uh-huh. all, I feel like Jewish people have this weird superpower that they can see other Jewish people. Oh. Because uh-huh. other people, like, I can't look at someone and be like, unless they're Hasidic, I'm like, yeah. oh, I don't know if they're Jewish. Well, it depends, like, because I've just found out, like, people I know are Jewish. Like, my best friend, Mandy, who um is also Jewish, she was blonde for a long time. So, like, I wouldn't have been able to spot her and say, oh, yeah, you're definitely <laughs> Jewish. You are, you're like me. I don't know. I think many Jewish people, this is a stereotype. Not all Jewish people are this way, but we do kind of have, like, a neurotic sense to us like the joke that i make is i don't have generalized anxiety disorder i'm just jewish because okay. <laughs> because the jews we haven't been able to rest since egypt like we always have to be on the lookout <laughs> always have to be on the lookout of like is that a nazi yeah i i always have to be that way always <laughs> <laughs> that's great mm-hmm. <laughs> now uh you said i'm sorry to jump back into that you said <laughs> yes i was a sophomore in college i was and I had a teacher, a professor, this professor knows who he is. He um, says, 
have you ever tried stand-up comedy? And I said, I tried it once when I was in sixth grade. I sucked at it. I'm not good at it. I don't want to do it. And he said, I think you should try it again. He gave me the title of a book to read. I did not read that book, I should say. <laughs> um, but what I found was that, like, regular stand-up comedy was just never going to work for me. Like, I've developed a bit of it over time, but, like, it's never been where I feel like, yeah, this is totally mm -hmm. where I succeed. I found that musical comedy was the path that I wanted to go down because, like, I mainly started out as a singer. I love writing. I do comedy, and I felt like, all right, what's going to be the best... What's going to be the best combination of all of my talents? Musical comedy. Uh, so... Well, but I'll be honest. The first time I heard you, like uh -huh. the main thought I took away was, you could tell she's a professionally trained singer. Oh yeah, like, like I've I've been taking voice lessons for a very long time. Like even Seneca Stone, who we both know, he's like, you you have a great voice, Caroline, and I'm like, I've been working at this for years. I better have a good voice after all this time. Yeah. <laughs> so, oh, uh, uh -huh. You said you were going to college for performing. Yeah, I went. I got a BFA in acting. BFA yeah. in acting. Uh -huh. Now, with that. Uh, where where does one take that academically, or do you just try and like start finding roles with something like that? <laughs> That's the question you should ask every performance major. Like, what are you gonna do with that? Okay. What are you gonna do with that? Um, after college, I did an apprenticeship. I was at a theater apprenticeship at a really great company called the Common Wheel Theater Company. Mm. Shout out to them. And I was an acting apprentice there, but I learned a lot of tricks of the trade. I acted. I did sound design. I did front of house stuff like ushering. And as our final capstone, we created a show. We created a show and I acted and I did the sound design. And it's, I still feel heartbroken about this. Um, the show only ran for one weekend. It was supposed to run for three, but it closed because of the pandemic. Oh, so, no. Yeah, it was awful. I was like, when I got the news, I just, my castmates could attest, I was just weeping, like in the final run of the show. Like, my character was already a very sad character, but I was just weeping on stage. And people were like, oh, you're weeping because the character's weeping. And I'm like, no, it's because this thing that I gave my blood and sweat to is closing early. Yeah, so I went back to L.A. and I was like, what the hell am I going to do with myself? And that's when I started doing comedy again. So Okay. Mm -hmm. And the musical comedy, it's its yeah. its very interesting. Mm -hmm. um, with that, like, you're, you're more traditional because I've seen some musical comics in the mm -hmm. area that kind of just put memes over a tune yeah like that's an intro because like i've had many conversations with people about what exactly here i'm gonna try to stand up straighter because posture so my mother doesn't look at this and say caroline what's why are you hunching um <laughs> no it's interesting i think many people are questioning what exactly defines a musical comic because like I, I think of dimitri martin specifically who like doesn't come up with melodies or lyrics he just plays guitar while he does his jokes and like the beautiful thing about musical comedy is that it kind of sets up the punchline for you. Like verse is the setup. The chorus is the pun. Mm. I'm covering this. I'm so sorry. The chorus is the punchline. So it's quite all right. Uh huh. We're a, uh, mm -hmm. we're a small shop here. <laughs> it's okay. If they get a behind the scenes. Piece. Oh yeah, exactly. Yeah. No, I just, I really respect that You're actually it, it writing songs mm -hmm. instead of just goofy shit with like, bow, da, 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 da. yeah yeah um mm -hmm. so <clears throat> can i ask you about your process of writing my process of writing it involves a lot of crying and swearing um <laughs> my process of writing it depends like the best advice i can give to comics when it's like where do you find material like just even living life and having conversations with your friends like i owe a lot to um my two fellow grantees Kevin and Joe because mm -hmm. a lot of the material that I've written like in my time here has just simply been from conversations with them like even what's like the variety pack song which is a song that I perform quite often now like I was on one of Kevin's writing workshops and he said write a song about variety packs mm -hmm. or something and that's when I started doing it and usually the way it works is that Sometimes I'll even just look up chord progressions and be like, all right, which chord progression is going to work? Does this work with the melody I'm trying to create? And then I'll write out the lyrics and then I'll just start to slowly workshop it as time goes on. I really like your Pittsburgh song. Oh, <laughs> I really Thank like you. it. Um, Thank you. And like, I wondered how people would respond to it. And then we had that show together and people seemed to love oh, it. Oh, no. I mean, well, Pittsburgh people love to be roasted. Yeah. They love to be roasted. They're like, we already know that we're like... We're a livable city. We're not a great city. We're livable. Yeah. So we enjoy that kind of self-deprecating humor. I'm not going to so. give your material away, but the line about the uh, airport signs. Oh, no. 
Thank Phenomenal. you. <laughs> I'm very proud of that. I must admit. Um, I was I was on my way to the Pittsburgh airport, and I was like in the car, and I was looking at it, and I'm like, geez, like we're half an hour away, and like everything's airport, airport, and then yeah. we were doing a gig out in like Sharpsburg or something, mm-hmm. but it's like an hour or two away from Pittsburgh, and we're like an hour out, and I'm like, there's an airport sign there. There is an airport sign there. Like, but we're like an hour away. What is this? So. Like everything directs back to the airport because they're trying to give you the easiest way to get the hell out of Pittsburgh. That's what I'm truly believing. So how do you like your stay in Pittsburgh so far? What do you I think like of the it. city? I like it. It's just once again, as I keep, re- I'm just revealing my own jokes. Like there's so many hills. <laughs> like I'm a walker. And so like my, my best friend, Manny, once again, like I like to go on what I describe as sad girl walks where I just like <laughs> put music, like blast music into my ears like very sad, very sad music. And I just walk and I'm like, I'm the main character of my story. Um, and you can't. <laughs> I do that with music about drug dealing. So oh. it's okay. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, I'm just, moving loads this week. Yeah. And you're just walking. You're trying to have your main character moment, but like you're walking up a hill and you're just panting. <laughs> and I remember telling my best friend Mandy about this and she said, you're no longer doing sad girl walking. You're doing sad girl exercise. Oh, so, <laughs> we've reached the pinnacle. Yeah. Like this is why so many Pittsburgh people have such amazing, like you have all your food that's piled with fries and then you walk up hills, so it cancels cancels no, it all out. We just have large calves. <laughs> just large calves. <laughs> yeah. Large, large calves. Like, what's the point of a gym here when you could just, you just, you could just up. walk up a hill? Yeah, I was telling uh, Kevin, that's probably mm-hmm. how I caught my first wife, just flashing the calves. <laughs> I say my first wife like there's multiple. <laughs> uh-huh. I mean, technically, she's the first. <laughs> uh, there's just not a second, so. <laughs> oh. my, my late wife. Mm-hmm. But, uh, no. It's just a lot of hills. All the directions are either mm-hmm. over a bridge or through a tunnel. Yeah. It's ridiculous. Mm-hmm. Um, so from L.A., can you tell me more about the uh, Arts Foundation and, and how you came to like uh, come to know about that and apply for that? Um, I was in a displaced comedians group, which is... Okay. Wait, are you a part of the displaced... I am. Com- it is a cesspool. <laughs> it is a cesspool. Every comedy group on Facebook uh-huh. is a shit show. Like... I truly think one day I'm just going to create a series like we're all that'll be the next Steel City project comedians in cars ruining comedy ruining careers comedians on online ruining their careers there we go cuz it's just arguing 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 but occasionally there's like good things and somebody said hey Steve Hofstetter is um doing this thing and you should apply and I'm like eh, I'll send in a tape like I'm probably not going to get it and like I literally forgot about it and then a couple months later, I um, get an email saying, hey, um, you're in the semifinals. And I'm like, okay, cool. And um, there's an essay portion. I write an essay and then I get interviewed. It's down to six people. And then three of us were chosen. And so that's when I was like, all right, I guess I'm going to Pittsburgh for a while. So What was the topic of your essay? Topic, um, it was a bunch of essay questions like, who are your comedic influences? Like, what would you get out of Steel City and like being in that space they sound like uh uh, inquisitive minds on paper (laughs) exactly like look we we don't need to do this podcast i'll just email you my essay and you could read it aloud and that'll be the podcast i am curious to know your your comedy influences my comedy influences who did i put who did i put down to seem interesting and cool um (laughs) like i'm more into avant-garde comedians like blah 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 (laughs) um I said Rachel Bloom. I don't know if you know who she is. I do not. Um, she created the show called Crazy Ex Girlfriend. I've heard she, of the show. It's a great show. Like it's a show that I saw a lot of myself and a lot of my friends. Like we all, many of us, love it because we're reformed theater kids who are Jewish. Um, but it's that's got to be a very specific face. A crazy. very specific genre. <laughs> um, but I see a lot of my comedy in her. That's the kind of comedy I would like to create. Um, Phoebe Waller-Bridge is not exactly a comedian, but um, the kind of work that she creates, it's like very funny and cutthroat, but also very honest and personal. Mm-hmm. I, that's the kind of work that I like to create. Um, Chris Fleming, who he creates a lot of weird... Like, have you ever seen the video Company is Coming? No. It's a very... He dresses up as a mom and he's like, going around the house shouting, company is coming, get rid of the chairs, we can't let people know that we sit! And it's genuinely one of the funny, I'll send it to you after this, it's genuinely one of the funniest videos I've ever seen. Yeah, I haven't seen that. It's so good. And like, I remember like, I mentioned him in my interview for Steel City and Steve said, 
I don't know who that is. And I'm like, oh boy, this is awkward. Um, And then obviously it should be a given Bo Burnham. Okay. Yeah. Like he's not my favorite comp. Don't, I love you, Bo Burnham. Please don't like come for me. Um, He's not my favorite comic. If Bo Burnham happens to hear if this. If Bo Burnham hears what this. What a godsend it'll be. What a godsend. Like I heard someone was saying things about me. Um. <laughs> He's not my favorite comic anymore at this point, but um, I definitely remember seeing his stuff when I was a sophomore in high school and like just throughout high school and thinking, oh, maybe it was kind of like a seed planted in the back of my mind of like, yeah, maybe this is maybe this is where my niche okay. niche niche. I don't know how to pronounce that. Whatever so, it is, where uh, where we fit in mm-hmm. is what we'll say. Yeah. Okay. That's uh, man, you threw me for a curveball because I only <laughs> knew one of the people you mentioned. <laughs> I feel like I need to do more homework now. Oh no, it's but like I we all have to do more homework. Like Kevin's favorite comedians, Joe's favorite comedians, like they'll be like, "Oh yeah, this is my favorite comedian." And I'm like, "Who the heck is that? Who is that? I don't know who that is." That's fair. I love mm-hmm. people like uh Godfrey. Godfrey, like, of course. He's well known, but I remember seeing him <laughs> mm-hmm. when I was like 12 on Premium mm-hmm. Blend. Like, so I don't know. There's people I like and then there's people that influence me mm-hmm. and sometimes uh, with current politics, it's hard to say those people's names. Like they're like, oh, well, I'm not him. I didn't tell him to say that. Mm-hmm. But you know what I mean. Like I love uh, Joey Diaz, mm-hmm. just because he was one of the guys that I saw. Okay, he went to prison. Yeah, and he became a stand-up. So like mm-hmm. it, it's oh, that's possible for me to do. Yeah. So he was like a big inspiration. I don't agree with everything he says, obviously. Yeah, of course not. But no. you know, there's so many people that I like for different reasons, mm-hmm. like Kathleen Madigan. She's mm-hmm. one of my favorite comics. Mm-hmm. I'm not Catholic. I'm not a woman. <laughs> I don't drink. I don't have mm-hmm. nieces and nephews I spend time with, but I think she's just hilarious. Well, that's the beauty of comedy, that like you get to hear stories from people who you would like never hear stories from usually. Like, I mean, that's, it's all about empathy. Mm-hmm. It's, all about, it's all about connecting in ways that you didn't think you could connect with other people. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Um. Could never connect with Jeff Foxworthy. <laughs> Just couldn't get it. Uh-huh. Uh, or Larry the Cable Guy. But mm-hmm. That's that's a different story. And shout out to one of, I think, one of the most underrated, underrated comics out there, Christopher Titus. Uh, oh, no, I've heard many a thing about Christopher Titus. He's yeah. a storm. I love him. Uh-huh. He's like wild shit, just crazy life. Um, but that's what I, I kind of want to know. Like, mm-hmm. It's about connecting with people. It's about sharing your experiences. Where are you coming from? What you said your your comedy genesis wasn't the traditional uh, ripped apart. It saved my mm-hmm. life. So what what aspect are you bringing to the table? And and not like that sounds. <laughs> what are you bringing yeah. to the? T- <laughs> Why should we challenge- hire you? It <laughs> sounds more challenging than I wanted it to. I really mean that. I just meant like, uh, can you share your perspective a little bit more? I mean, in the end, I feel like I do. I really feel terrible for saying it that way because I don't. <laughs> no, I know. Yeah. What makes you what worthy? Makes you, no. Why should no. we just put you on this show? <laughs> just like, can you share your perspective with us? I mean, I have always felt that I create comedy by women for women or just any underrepresented gender. Because in the end, like, it's still primarily a male dominated field. Mm-hmm. I mean, there's tons of incredible woman comics coming up, but like. I'll be blood. I go to most open mic nights and I'm like, oh, wow, there's like maybe only two or three other women here. Are you ready for some dick jokes? Ready for some dick jokes. Ready for some dick jokes. Um, t- So I feel like a lot of my perspective is on the um, trials and tribulations of being a young woman, being 24. And my comedy was very much about sex for a very long time. Now it's more focused on Judaism and death i don't know <laughs> <laughs> that's a great switch mm-hmm. i love it um have you uh what what have you been your unique experiences being a, a jewish a female woman in a in the comedy scene a jewish female woman well um like it's it's an interesting question because sometimes you have to ask the question of like you hear somebody say something problematic and you're like do i let that slide or do i speak up mm. like cuz i've had more than one experience where somebody will say something and you're like, oh, wait, that is absolutely not okay for them to say. Like, I'm, I don't want to name names, but um, I'll give one example. Um, 
Salutation Shades, and welcome back to your one-stop shop for all things strange and unusual, Talking with Shadows, the conversation everyone has, but no one wants to admit to. Here with your host, Vic Whaley. And Marcus D. Now come along with us as we explore the most obscure things our universe has to offer. We specialize in helping people make sense of the most bizarre phenomenon you'll ever come across. You'll get all the great topics such as UFOs, cryptids, and psychic phenomenon, but also some stories that are so spectacular, they scare people to believe that they're true. Now take a seat, and welcome to the One Candle Society. But always remember, keep believing. Because we'll keep listening. All right, let's blow up a let's mm-hmm. blow up an open micer. Yeah, no, I'm um, I'm not gonna do anyone from the Pittsburgh scene unless the pre like th- for bonus you could hear me name names. Um, <laughs> I was doing an online show last year. I'm not gonna name who it was, even though I've talked openly about this experience. Um, but they asked me to be on their New Year's show, and I said cool. And I was already on the show, and it was like very broy comedy, and like to every each his own. If somebody loves that kind of comedy, sure, we all have different tastes, but um. They were doing this weird conspiracy thing, and then finally they concluded with the comics saying, and that's why the Holocaust isn't real. Mm. That's a rough one. That's a very rough one, and you're like, ha ha ha. Like, you wanna look at you wanna look at the pile of shoes in the Auschwitz Museum? Like It's uh Yeah. Yeah. I see. Mm-hmm. I you can't uh, I I can't yeah. ever tell anybody what they can and can't say. Uh-huh. But that's like that's rough stuff. Yeah, well, because, like, my rule is always, I mean, many people differ on what what's too far and what's not far enough. My rule kind of always is I can forgive a really inappropriate or cutting-edge joke if it's funny. Mm-hmm. Like, that's always my rule. Like, I have exceptions for it. But, like, when it's just specifically, like, it's just a statement. Yeah. It's just simply a statement, and I'm like, what exactly is the joke? And so... I remember in that moment, like, and of course I was next. Oh, <laughs> of course, segue. of course. And like, I was like, do you say something? Do you not say something? And I was like, screw it. I'm going to say something. So I straight up said, excuse me for being shaky. I'm a Jewish comedian. I don't think Holocaust jokes are funny. Um, That's fair. Yeah. And this is awful to say, but nothing brings me more joy than when I see a group chat of men, men panic. <laughs> yeah. Because they were they were freaking out. They were like, "You made a Holocaust joke before a Jewish comedian," and the, <laughs> yeah, and um, and the guy said, "I'm sorry, I was just doing it for the laugh." And I'm like, <laughs> "Oh," and I'm like, "But I I would just I want to track him down and be like, I just want you to explain. Please tell me why is that funny? P- please, from your point of view, I want you to explain to me why is that funny." I was just doing it for the laugh. Just doing it for the... Well, what laugh? Because nobody's laughing. So. I was riding the laugh, I was man. riding the laugh, and I'm like, who's laughing? Please tell me. So. The, the the reason specifically behind... Like, it's not terror. It's uh-huh. not funny. Uh-huh. But the fact that there's actually people that believe that... Oh, no, it's ...is terrifying. why I won't, like, add mm-hmm. fuel to that fire, yeah. even as a joke. Because, mm-hmm. like, I, the last thing I need is an audience member coming up to me and be like, hey, man... That was the right material. You, mm-hmm. you're like on the you're right telling path. the truth. It's yeah. like, oh no, you're doing the Lord's work you up here. Are, you are spreading the message. Like, oh god, like that's always terrifying. That there are, are people who genuinely still believe those kinds of things. It's not possible, didn't it? Okay. Mm-hmm. Speaking of conspiracies, <laughs> do you subscribe to any? Do I subscribe to any conspiracies? Um. I was I was waiting at the bus and I did see a pigeon here and I I strongly believe that pigeons aren't real. <laughs> I think pigeons were cuz even I got into an argument with Kevin about this I'm like pigeons aren't real. Like they were they're actually government spies. <laughs> There's cameras placed inside of them and it's the government watching us. And I said, "Have you ever seen a baby pigeon, Kevin?" And he said, "Caroline, I raised baby pigeons, so I know that pigeons are real." So And I'm like, "Yeah, sure, Kevin." Sure. Honestly, birds aren't real. Look, I hate is birds. Is my favorite conspiracy. Yeah. I, that, I hate birds. That falls under like ridiculous. Oh, 100. Like birds are stupid. Yeah. Like cuz I think about it and I'm like for envi- I could give a bee for environmental reasons. Maybe I could give a pork or something, but chickens, I'm happy we eat chickens cuz I hate chickens. 
Chickens right. are ugly. Finally, someone on my side. Chickens are ugly. They are terrifying. Like maybe chicklets, like I can, I can, chicklets, they're fine. They're harmless. But like chicken, turkeys specifically. Turkeys are very ugly. Turkeys are terrifying. Like that is what is, in, exactly. Like that's my nightmare fuel. I'm lying in bed. I hear the gobble. And then, and then I turn around and there is a, t- the door is wide open and it's just the shadow of a turkey. I've dealt with a lot of different poultry in my life, <laughs> and uh, chickens have always been assholes to me. Chicken, like they just they are. That's uh, why they're called cock because they're assholes because they're dicks. I, I'm proud to say that I've uh, more chickens have uh, come at the end of their rope at my hands than I would like to admit, but I'm very proud of that fact. Because uh, fuck chickens, fuck fuck them, fuck turkeys. Uh, there's turkeys on the north side now. They're- I was driving up to my mom's house because she still lives on the north side. And uh, there was turkeys right down on the bottom of McIntyre. Look, run them over, Johnny. I give you full permission. Run oh, them over. Th- between those and the deer, I'm going crazy. <laughs> Look, the deer, I think the deer in Pittsburgh are suicidal. Oh. I mean, I think most deer are suicidal, but like specifically Pittsburgh deer, I I think they, 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 they want to be dead. They like they wake up every morning and they're like, frick, I live in Pittsburgh. Psh. The, I drive uh, mm-hmm. for a living. Yeah. And honestly, I see about 20 deer a night just all over the city. Mm-hmm. And it's absurd. It's absurd. They mm-hmm. don't use the crosswalks. <laughs> it just Like they need to wait at the light. They are <laughs> they are some of the banes of my existence. I hate them. I, and I'll stand behind that, PETA. You can go fuck yourself, you fraud organization. <laughs> uh, it's funny because when I said that, I mm-hmm. realized that uh, didn't Steve have something against PETA? Apparently, I don't keep up with that stuff, I just, to be quite honest. I remember Penn and Teller used to have a television uh-huh. show on Showtime called Bullshit, yeah. where they would expose things, uh-huh. and they exposed PETA. Oh, yeah. No, PETA's a load of BS. They're it's bullshit. a load of BS. Yeah. Yeah, like just the way it's all a bunch of shock stuff to get you on their side. And in the end, like the vegans will come for me. Like The thing about veganism is that many people don't realize that it's not accessible to mm. everybody. Also, with most environmental issues, they like to put it on the individual of like, you're not doing this enough. You're not doing that enough. When in the end, most of the time, it's major capitalistic corporations who are the cause of most pollution and most of the environmental issues that we're facing. So, Well said. Mm -hmm. Well said. Um, No, definitely birds aren't real. Yeah, birds are stupid. Of the ridiculous conspiracy (laughs) theories. Uh Um, That's like, like if you would have said flat earth, but you would have legitimately meant it. I'd have been like, well, folks, uh, this interview's over. The interview's over. <laughs> like, just throw me out, catapult me. Those okay. guys are ridiculous. Uh, yeah. I will say that every chance I get, I will mm-hmm. shit on flat earthers. Yeah. I will shit on hollow moon guys. Mm-hmm. And I will shit on hollow earth guys. Hollow earth. They, so they just don't believe that, like, there's lava in the middle of the nope. earth? Nope. Government bases and such tunnels and, and mole men and all types of civilizations and the lizard people are down there. I do believe there's lizard aliens. I don't know if they're shapeshifters. There's a lot going on, though. Look, religion doesn't work for some people. We all got to believe in something sometime. What's your thoughts on aliens? Thoughts on aliens? Aliens. I don't, I mean, like, I think that is there the potential that there is life out there? There are other planets, sure, but, like, it's not something I dwell on. Like, if aliens, I mean, the question is, like, why would aliens want to come to Earth anyway? Like, look at us. I spend more of my time uh-huh. thinking about aliens than I'd like to admit. That that is a picture I had painted of me as Bigfoot being abducted by an alien. Oh my god. Yeah. Um, I also had that picture commissioned and I just I gave four keywords. Uh-huh. I said stand up, Joe Rogan, uh, Captain America and Mothman, and that's what the hell they came up with. That's a, that's a great photo. If you can tell uh Captain America's jerking off in the corner. And I believe the artist doesn't know what Mothman is, so it's a moth-sized man doing stand-up. Is that The Boys? Is that the Amazon Prime series, The Boys? Yeah, yeah that's actually what it's closer to. If you no, think yeah, because like I'm thinking of the character. What's it's like the uh, lead? What's his? Lo- yeah, I don't remember his name, but literally there's a scene at the very end of season two. Spoiler alert: where he's like doing, doing the action yeah. in that painting. Ah. Uh. What is his name? I d- Homelander. 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 Stupid name. Great show. It's though. a great show. Bear, kind of shock value-y at some point, but it's it's a fun show. I enjoy it. I yeah. like it uh, that it deals with like because Marvel deals with heroes mm-hmm. that are have flaws, but mm-hmm. these ones have like these are real these are human evil people. Flaws. These yeah. are just evil people. Like the so, guy when it starts off, him 
crushing like uh, the oh, woman. Oh, crushing, yeah, crushing the lead character's girlfriend. I've always thought, has something like that never happened before? Because you think they're, uh-huh. I don't know. That's just, don't, I, this is why I'm a comic, I guess. Check uh-huh. out, my, I'm, I'm thinking about all these profound things. Check out all the material about my penis. Because, um, I don't know. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Where were we going? I was talking. I was asking about aliens. So you don't yes. think they've? Uh, do you think they've uh, interacted? Do you think they've come down? Maybe. I mean, like there is Area Fifty One or something. Mm-hmm. Who knows? Maybe the government knows something that we don't know. But in the end, if the government doesn't want us to know it, then it is not my business to know it. Mm. That is a uh, hell of a thought. Uh-huh. Huh. Uh huh. Huh. The first episode I did on this show, I actually mm-hmm. was talking about the crash at Roswell. I don't know a lot. Please tell me about that. I'm curious. Well, uh, 47. Uh-huh. Uh, it was found by like, uh, and I, I'm going to mess up some of the details, mm-hmm. but it was found like by like a farmer and his son or what have you. Mm-hmm. And the, the newspaper even reported that they found an alien crash site. And then the government came in and then, you know, the story changed and actual, uh, the debris actually changed from uh, some of it, because it was like thin metal Mm -hmm. and weird uh, components that we don't have access to or we don't Mm -hmm. know about. But then the next day, it was pictures of a weather balloon broken pieces. And then there was a radio guy that was going to go public with like the knowledge, but then, and this is all factual, like he got shut down and threatened by the government to not air his tapes or whatever and disappeared. I honestly think it was an alien, but I think it was so convoluted over the years because there's stories of like little green men being found and well it just convoluted i think it could have been something out of this world i think it could have been something that's government technology uh but i don't think it was a weather balloon if i'm being honest it could be of this earth yeah government's far more advanced than we are you know i'm sure they have technology even then that would look foreign to a, a farmer in new mexico in 1947 I just went off on a tangent there. <laughs> no, it's fascinating to hear about. I mean, like, I do believe sometimes that there are th- unexplainable things. Like, I'm usually more of, like, a logic kind of person of, like, I don't know. It dep- depends on the mood that I'm in. Because mm-hmm. if I'm, like, if I'm if I'm in a good place, if I'm, like, straightforward thinking, I'm like, yeah, there must be a logical thing. But call me when I'm feeling anxious or depressed or something. I'm like, maybe it's something else. We don't know. So. I love, uh, I just love paranormal stuff yeah. on any level, just mm-hmm. because to me, it's the only thing still left as an adulthood that has like fun and mystery. Oh, no. I mean, like all that stuff is really fun. Like, I think it's always fun to kind of delve into the, um, the unknown stuff, like what's real and what, what I really, isn't. I really get bummed out by some of the videos I get sent mm-hmm. that people that know that I'm into will be like, oh, check out this alien sighting. Mm-hmm. And it's like clearly a blimp. Or a plane, and I'm like, Uh come on, I'm not, like, I want to see something, but I'm not going to just be like, oh, that's it right there, like, blindly. Mm -hmm. But I've never seen an alien. Have you ever seen a ghost? No, I mean, I've been ghosted many a time, Uh, and I don't know, I'm a little bit spiritual, I believe... Sometimes, like, I know that our energy, when we die, it goes somewhere, Mm -hmm. And like that there is energy left, but no, I've never seen a ghost. That would be fun. That'd be a fun time. (laughs) Depending on the experience. Depending on the experience. I've never had, with at least a ghost, Mm -hmm. I'll say, a particularly like overwhelming Mm -hmm. terror experience. Mm -hmm. But I've seen quite a few ghosts. You have. I have. I have. The first one I saw, um, you could call it a shadow person. Mm Mm-hmm. But it was, uh, I was about five years old. Now we were outside and uh, we lived in the apartments at the time, the projects. Mm -hmm. So the mailboxes were, you know, like however many hundreds there. But it was a little plot. And there was light shining around. It was at night. And I was outside with my mother and she was talking to somebody. And I was Mm -hmm. watching. And there's a shadow of a boy just walking around the mailboxes. But there's no person. Like, and it's not like it was a shadow that could have been made, like, through somebody's hand or anything. It was like there was a person walking around, but no person. And then when I said, Mom, look, you know, I'll stop messing around. I'm talking. But that was my first ever experience. And since then, I've seen a bunch of shit. Wow. Yeah, I've done some uh, 
amateur investigating and some it's it's a lot of fun, you know, until it's not, I guess. Like I'll wait for the time when it's not fun. <laughs> maybe maybe the spiritual world is trying to communicate something to you. I wish it would speak a little louder. <laughs> like uh, the one thing and I think I mentioned this before, the one thing I used to do uh, with my wife is we'd have mm-hmm. these conversations. Yeah. You know, if I die first, I'll come and haunt you. You die mm-hmm. first, come and haunt me. Okay. That bitch is nowhere to be seen. <laughs> I am highly disappointed. Like, not a, not a, ooh, you not were a literally cold ghosted. Mist. You yeah. were literally ghosted. Ghosted in real life. Uh huh. Oh, God. No, I just, I don't know. I, I think it's one of those things, too, that maybe there's more in a couple hundred years that we'll know. Mm-hmm. You know, because some of the technology we have today, 200 years ago, was witchcraft or mm-hmm. science. Like, imagine trying to explain a cell phone. Oh, yeah. I have this uh, robot in my hand. I don't know. Mm-hmm. But so uh, how does this work? Do, when you guys are here, how, you're you here for six months? Yeah, um, I am. My residency is done in se- December. Yes. It's done in December. Uh-huh. Now, uh, did you work? Was there um, something like how did you financially uh, do this? Did you have saved up or was there work? Luckily, I had a lot of savings. The one benefit of living at home for a year was that I got to save a lot of money. So luckily I feel very lucky money hasn't been a big issue. Also, like I supply a lot of my income through gigs. Mm -hmm. Like the one good thing about this is that if I had just been in LA, like getting gigs would have been absolutely impossible getting paid gigs even more than that. But, um, the good thing about being out here is that I have been able to do quite a few, quite a few stand-up comedy bits, and I've been paid for the majority of them. So I'm thankful for that. And you got a is that, was that a festival coming up? Yeah, I'm um, this week in Ladies Room Comedy Festival. Yeah. Congrats on that. Thank you. I'm I'm excited for it. It's gonna be good. Yeah. You've done uh, multiple festivals before? Yeah. Some I did the Plano Virtual Comedy Festival and the New York Underground Comedy Festival. I mean, but those were online, so it'll be fun to do something. Either way, congrats Thank on you. all that. Yeah, that's dope. So uh, wh- where is that being held at? Um, New York, and it's going to be at the Broadway Comedy Club. So. Okay, that's a great venue. Yeah, I'm excited for it. It's going to no, be That's good. really fun. Congrats uh-huh. on that. Thank oh, man, you. that's huge. Thank you. This will air uh, after that. This but will, yeah. We wish you all the success in the world up there. Uh-huh. Yeah, we'll see. Like, it's... Because in the end with comedy festivals, like comedy, so much of it is subjective. And the most important thing isn't winning or make it to, to the next round. The most important thing is um, getting to meet people you wouldn't mm-hmm. otherwise meet and hopefully networking. Yeah. Mm-hmm. No, I, and you know what? I didn't realize up until the other day there was a post you had made that you were as young as you are. Yeah. So how long, exa- are, you, well, how long are you in comedy? Um, I've been at it for about four to five years on and off. Okay. So... Yeah, it's weird to define it because, like, I technically started in my sophomore year of college and, like, then in my senior year, like, I did it on and off. I did my show again, did not go well. And then when I was at Apprentice, I just, I didn't do any comedy at all. Like, I don't think I wrote a comedy song for, like, a year and a half to two years until the pandemic started, so. Can you explain a little bit of the differences between, the like, the L.A. comedy scene and the Pittsburgh comedy scene? Just Um, because I have this frame of reference. Well, it's weird because I started technically doing comedy in Oklahoma City. Oh, really? And then, yeah, that's, I started in college mainly. Oh, okay. I didn't, I didn't know where you went to college. I'm sorry. Um, I went to college in Oklahoma City. Yeah. Which is, people are like, you're from LA. Why did you go to Oklahoma City to do acting? And I'm like, money. Um, I got, I luckily got a lot of scholarships. That's a good point. Money, always. Um, but, um, from the bits of the LA scene that I have experienced, uh, what I like about it is that it is a very diverse scene. Like I'll go on, like I did quite a few flappers virtual shows. Mm-hmm. And what I liked about it was that it was a variety of ages, like a variety of races, variety of gender. And like, I felt like I got a huge variety of experiences watching other people do comedy in LA. I agree. Mm-hmm. I, I agree. That's always a, a, an eye opening experience. Yeah. We can only like think what, what we think is funny, I guess. Mm-hmm. And, to get some perspective. Uh, real quick, promo yourself. Promo myself. Um, I'll be in Ladies Room Comedy Festival this weekend. Um, I'm also going to be in David Kay's um, How the Eggnog Ruined Christmas. So we're going to be playing at Carnegie Theater September 19th and 20th, I think. So go check that out. We'll be at Crackpots the first week of December and then Parkway the third week. So 
come check that out because it's going to be a great show. Shout out to your uh, social medias and all that. Um, you Where can, follow, can the people find you? You can follow me on Twitter at Carol the Comic, uh, Instagram Caroline Need Hawthorne, my TikTok account Too Hot for Hawthorne. So. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Yeah, I'm very proud of that name. Very okay. Proud of it. Uh huh. MC Auto Detailing is a home-based detailing company located in Aliquippa, Pennsylvania. At MC Auto, we take care of all of your detailing needs from a basic hand wash to a complete makeover of your vehicle. Busy schedule? MC Auto is also mobile. You can get your vehicle detailed in the comfort of your own home. With a five-star rating on Google, we treat your vehicle as if it was our own. For a free quote, and more information, contact MC Auto on Facebook and Instagram at MC Auto Detailing LLC or call 724-462-4863. MC Auto Detailing. Who doesn't like a clean car? Um, what do you do on TikTok? Because I, I, that's one of the things mm-hmm. I'm not on yet. And like my buddy Joey r- doing well on there. And I have a lot of people that have different experiences. What kind of uh, content do you put out on TikTok? I, random. I do have a funny story. What what time is it? Uh, Three twenty seven. Cool. Um, I, I'll tell the quick story. Um, I actually went viral on TikTok literally a year ago to yesterday. I went viral on TikTok for shaving my legs. Really? Yes. Okay. What about uh, <laughs> what about the like what about the video <laughs> made it go? Viral? I wish I knew. I wish. I, well, like but you were just shaving. Your I legs. haven't. I hadn't shaved for eight months. Because we were in the pandemic. <laughs> okay. And I was like, you know what? It's been eight months. It's time to shave. And a lot. I already am a very hairy person. So a lot of hair had grown. Um, and I think it was just very fascinating to people. Like, that was so funny to me. People were like, what a fascinating video. I'm like, it's, it's, it's legs. It's legs. That's the wild thing about the internet. Dude. Yeah, it's amazing. Like, but it's funny because, like, even still to this day, it's been a year, but I still have a debate going on in my comments about whether women not shaving should be normalized. Oh my! Like literally, like that's like half my comment section. Like people, like people being like, normalize women not shaving, and numerous internet trolls just responding, no. So, ladies, uh-huh. do what you want. Yeah, it's like there's already so many other issues. There's so many issues happening in the world. Why do you care whether or not people are shaving? <laughs> there's so many bigger fish to fry. Like. There are people dying. I don't know of what, but there are people dying. And your big, the thing that you are choosing to throw a hissy fit about is whether or not women should be shit. But the interesting thing, I thought it was going to primarily be like men. It was actually a lot of young women who were my age who were commenting and duetting and saying, this is disgusting. So I was very shocked by that. Yeah. What a world we are living in. Mm-hmm. I, I would, I, I just, I get baffled by those debates. Uh huh. Yeah. Cause it's like, who cares? Like it's like wh- why is this the thing you're? Because I think there's many like debates in the feminist community about what things should we be focusing on, and like those things just feel very minuscule in the span of all the other problems that people face. Like if you're, if the main thing that you are debating is whether or not women should like be able to shave their legs or not, you probably have you're probably very privileged. I'm you drunk. probably have a lot of time on your hands if these are the main things that you're thinking about. I'm I'm Johnny Smith here with Fox News. Today we're asking the tough, hard questions. Uh Women's armpits, are you for it or against it? Uh And some guy's like, well, in the Bible, women are supposed (laughs) to shave their arms. It's like, come on. Does it say that anywhere? I don't even know. I I don't don't care. I don't care. I don't think so. I don't Uh know. (laughs) It's it's an abomination. A man and woman. It's an abomination for women to have hair. (laughs) It's it's, it's just remarkable to me that... Mm -hmm. I don't it, it, it's even wilder to me that there's still young people, people younger than myself, men mm-hmm. specifically that are getting riled up about this like Oh, plenty. Yeah. How What is going on in your household? Mm-hmm. Like does your dad wake up like grab your mom by the hair like time for you to get up? Like Yeah. Is that I mean, what's going on? There are going people on? that still live like that. There are people who still live like that. Yeah. I mean, don't get me wrong, mine mine mm-hmm. and my wife's roles, we were traditional. She mm-hmm. didn't work, I worked, but that's mm-hmm. how we wanted it. Yeah. If anybody knew her, they would have never said she was a woman that uh, was being domestically abused. Oh, no. She was a wild woman. <laughs> uh, there, <laughs> trust me, abusing uh-huh. her would have not ended well. <laughs> but it's like, live your life. Do what you want to mm-hmm. do. I don't know. Um, Caroline, what advice do you have for people out here? This is usually the time in the episode where I ask people to share uh, a piece of advice for the listeners, and it doesn't have to be 
about comedy or art or anything specific about hairy legs, just whatever you feel, uh, what advice the people would get good from you. My advice is just don't pursue comedy. It's not worth it. Um, <laughs> my advice, well, I, like, I've been thinking about this, like for comedy's sake or just art's sake, like my work became a lot better like because I was very much a workaholic for a very long time. Um, but my work became a lot better when I also lived life as well. Because sometimes the best thing you could do for yourself is just not, is not write constantly. It's not hustle. Sometimes the best thing you could do for yourself is just give yourself a break. Like, go, go kiss people. Go hang with friends. Like, go do stupid things. I, I don't do many stupid things. But, like, go, go live life. Because in the end, like, comedy and art is about being a human. So in the end, you have to be a human if you want to write about being a human. That was beautiful advice. Thank you. Actually, that was very like uh, poetically romantic. Oh, thank you. Go out and live life. Go, go live kiss life. people. Go have experiences. Yeah. That was that was amazing. Thank you. Um, uh, uh, Johnny Lee Dam. You familiar with him? Yeah, I am. Yeah. He, I, we just on a show together, all of us. I'm uh-huh. an idiot. Sometimes. Oh yeah, we were all on the show. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> we were all on a show like two <laughs> weeks ago. Uh huh. Um, no, we completely ignored each other. Mm-hmm. Um. He once told me when I first started, he's like, make sure you don't forget to live life. Yeah. So, like, that was sage advice. Mm-hmm. Oh, my. So, what are, what are your plans moving forward after you leave uh, Pittsburgh and <laughs> go back to L.A.? <laughs> um, I don't know. Um, <laughs> okay. We'll see. Like, I'm going to probably go back to L.A. We'll see what happens from there. Like, may, may I go to grad school? May not? I don't know. We'll see. Okay. Now, grad school, what would you be – What like uh, – and this is just my ignorance. I mm-hmm. don't know. Like, do you take the uh, degree you have and keep pursuing that? And- no, you could pursue. I would pursue classical voice, probably. <laughs> okay. Yeah, because when I got into college, it was either between a school for acting or a school for classical voice, and I've always questioned what my life would have been like if I had still studied that. I mean, I I keep up that training, so maybe I'll do it because it's something that I've always wanted to do. But I don't know yet. We'll see. Like, even my mom has said that. You've already had a lot of experience that many people your age haven't had. Like, do you, what are you going to learn from grad school? I'm like, I don't know. We'll see. Maybe. I don't know. I mean, sometimes that piece mm-hmm. of paper just comes with a higher paycheck. Oh, 100%. Like, it just, it's so sad that sometimes it's just simply like having the label of I went to grad school, I went to college, I did this, I did that. It doesn't actually measure your talent. It's just people are like, oh, you did this, so you must know more, when that is absolutely not the case. Yeah, that's why I think I'm going to start getting introduced on stage as jo- Dr. Johnny Smith. Dr. Johnny Smith. What are you a doctor of? Uh, Awesomeology. Um, pepper? I don't know. Yeah. So- I'm the doctor of pepper. <laughs> I'm, that's like the Duke of Sandwich. Mm-hmm. The Earl of Sandwich. <laughs> okay, I mean, that's fair. Mm-hmm. Um, you're still incredibly young. I want to give you a lot of uh, credit and, and like... You. uh What's the word I'm looking for? I'm just trying to compliment you. Oh, thank you. You're impressive, especially like e- as stand alone. But then when you find out you're as young as you are, that's very impressive. Thank um, you. Keep up the good work about singing. Mm-hmm. Now, is that some something like a skill people can pick up and learn, like to improve? Because uh, not all of us can sing well. <laughs> well, it depends. I believe anybody can sing. I mean, it's just a lot of it depends on kind of the style that you're going afterwards, like. I think if you're a pop singer, like, I think you could probably just do that on your own. But if you want to do opera or something, like, you definitely need training for that because you got to learn diction, you got to learn music theory, stuff like that. But I think many people, they do overthink singing. Mm -hmm. And in the end, like, I always recommend learning how to sing because, like, you take singing lessons to protect yourself, to have longevity. So you can, like, sing for eight shows a week. So you can, like, keep this going forever because you hear so many horror stories about singers like not using their instrument correctly and then just like they lose their voices in like a couple of years time but i'm a strong believer that anybody can sing and it doesn't always have to be for like profit it could just because you love singing yeah mm-hmm. no I, I, everybody wants everything for profit oh 100 um, percent. yeah i've only been a stand-up for a little over three mm-hmm. years but i've seen so many people come and go uh just in our lo- local scene yeah and then on top of that so many people have come to like three or four mics uh-huh. and then i've had a, like weird conversation with them they're like yeah mm-hmm. i'm about to start getting paid for this it's time to start doing this and that and i'm just like like i know i don't have all the answers but mm-hmm. like one of the answers is to keep working keep oh, working yeah. on your craft and like 
like I'm blessed to be able to make enough money outside of comedy mm-hmm. that like it doesn't at this point matter to me to make fifty dollars mm-hmm. or twenty dollars. But like if I focused on just money, mm-hmm. I think my craft would suffer that much more. Oh, one hundred percent. Yeah, I mean that's one of the difficult one of my big regrets from school was like I used to have the mindset of like this is the only thing I'm going to do. Like, forget all other interests. These are the only, my art's all I'm going to do. But then suddenly you leave and you're like, oh, wow, it takes a while to just support yourself with your art. What are, what are other interests you have that are going to, like, supply income while Absolutely. you're waiting for your art to take off? So, Have you ever thought, because, and this is always, like, another mm-hmm. idea I romanticize, but you ever thought about, like, singing on, like, a street corner or somewhere? Not. Oh, no. <laughs> not like that. No. Let, me, let me paint the picture a little mm-hmm. more. Like uh, how there's musicians in New York in the parks and in the subway. Have you ever thought about doing that? Just as an experience. I'm not saying like as a full time gig. Nah, I have no. I I thought about (laughs) taking a a PA system Uh and just pulling up on a corner somewhere, planting myself and Uh just talking shit and telling jokes and seeing how Mm -hmm. it would go till I got kicked out. I think that's beautiful. That experience is not from it. You know what it reminds me of? There was this video on the internet of this girl pulling up to a drive through and she's singing her Chick-fil-A order. Like, can I get a number one with a lemonade and a Chick-fil-A sauce? I hate how it's in my head. And I, <laughs> I watched it and I was like, this is why people want the arts to be defunded. This is why people want the arts to be defunded. Because it was just one of the genuine theater kids. It's an interesting. I often talk about theater kids or just performers in general about how it's such a weird career because there is something inherently narcissistic about wanting to be a solo performance artist like there is something kind of like self-righteous if you think I deserve to be looked at I deserve to be watched but that it's a weird combination because you're never going to meet a group of people that hates themselves more than solo performance (laughs) artists and I think specifically a theater kids but like some stand-ups Many stand-ups. Oh, there's um, a lot of stand-ups. So many that, stand-ups. It's like, yeah. are they going to end it tonight? <laughs> is tonight the night? <laughs> is, it, is this the last time we're seeing them pull dick jokes on stage? What, what? happened to Frank? Did he quit? No, he... he finally ended it. <laughs> he finally. Uh, it couldn't have happened to a nicer guy. Yeah, Frank's not a real guy. person. Thank <laughs> God. There's Franks in every comedy scene. Uh-huh. Yeah, there's, of course. There. But yeah, no, it's more the matter that like every time I think of like that fantasy of like a singer singing in a corner and I'm like, why do you think your art is the greatest gift to earth? Maybe one day I'll believe when I actually, when I reach a certain point, maybe one day I'll believe that my art is God's greatest gift to earth. But at this point, I don't, I don't think that I can't. It's not like I can even let myself think that it's, I just, I know that I know that. I I appreciate that because mm-hmm. growing up and I'm sure it's, it's more, you know, when you're in this community, but even growing up mm-hmm. outside of it, you meet so many people that, oh, I want to be a singer. I want to be a model. Mm-hmm. Or I want to be an actor. They don't do anything to pursue it. No, they don't do the work. And I admit it, there's many factors. Because I think we used to have the mindset of, like, they're just not working hard enough. But there's many factors that, like, get... One of the best... I wrote for um, a satire site called The Broadway Beat. And um, the article that I wrote that I was the most proud of was, um, Why Don't We Have More Diversity? Says acting school with $100 application fee. I was very proud of that. That's a good point. Thank, because like, in the end, there's plenty of gatekeepers. Even in comedy, there's gatekeepers. Like to like fe- to go to festivals. Huh. Oh, let's to get net- started. Oh let's my be- god, to go to you festivals. cracked it open now. To go to festivals, to network, to like even meet people. It's like you have to pay. You have to drive a lot. You have to pay a lot of gas money. You have to like fly. You have to like pay for festival fees, hotels, all that stuff. And it's it's a lot. In comedy, uh-huh. there are gatekeepers that don't have anything behind the gate sometimes. Oh, exactly. Because like in theater, you're like, you could sort of understand, but in comedy, it's like you like are an unknown nightclub and you're just and you only pay fifty bucks a gig and you're going to keep you're gonna gatekeep me. What? You're even thinking better. There's uh-huh. people it's like, I don't give a shit about getting five minutes on your bar show uh-huh. on a on a Tuesday night. Yeah. Like you don't have to be an asshole. They're like you're not king of this castle. Oh, no. I don't want to get riled up because when we start talking about gatekeepers and <laughs> comedy, I'm like, oh, just start kicking them. Just uh-huh. start kicking them. Yeah, your shitty club that no one knows about, fuck you and your $50. Oh, yeah. And you know what? I'm going to say this. I don't like people that specifically have to uh, 
build themselves off up off of pushing others down. Oh, Oh, one hundred percent. I hate that yeah. shit. Um, I hate people. That, I hate a lot of people. Apparently, <laughs> I hate people that don't remember how terrible we all are when we first start. Oh, one hundred. Well, I still feel like most of the time I go to an open mic night, and I I like bomb most times. Absolutely. I bomb most times. Like that's another piece of advice. I'm like, get used to most of your writing sucking. <laughs> yeah. Like, sucking bad. Sucking <laughs> badly. Like, in the end, most of the things you're going to produce are not going to be good. Like, maybe was it a blue moon? You, I, like, maybe on a given day, I, like, maybe one or two pieces of writing that I've done in my entire work of comedy. Maybe one or two. Other other little tip, too. The joke that you'll end up, uh, you'll hate saying that makes you miserable to say it is one of the jokes that will actually work. Oh, 100%. Like, like, it's, like I can't believe i got to say this stupid shit again. Oh, it is always the material where you're like, eh, this is not my best, but I feel fine about it. That's always the material that people are like, yeah, that's what we love. So I've had shows where I bomb the whole time, but I talk about that joke of going to McDonald's uh-huh. about my penis, and I say I ended up leaving with a McChubby. And <laughs> there's been times that's the only joke that has hit, and I've literally stopped and gone, really? That's the fucking one that gets like, you. That's the one that you like? Out of all this shit I tried to say and paint for you, that stupid line is the one that gets you. Uh-huh. And I hate it. I hate saying it, but. Mm-hmm. No, I I won to um an improv show recently. I'm not going to say who the comic was. Um, <laughs> This is a lot of that. I'm going to throw shade, but I'm not going to say who I'm throwing shade about. But like, he's a comic who, like we were talking earlier about comics who just like do music under it while they say jokes. But like. That's his main thing. And he's a great comic, but like I was noticing he was doing parodies and some songs and like he was playing maybe two or three chords under it. And it was so simple. It was so utterly simple and the audience loved it. And I was just, I remember just being in the car on the way back and thinking, I work so hard to create such funny, clever lyrics out of interesting topics and I don't get any laughs. And him just like saying such simple things, that's what gets people going. If no words are truer, it's comedy is maddening. Oh, co- yeah. Like, you never know. Yeah, and it's a weird thing, because, like, I, I know you probably had the experience of, like, testing material, and you're like, is this actually bad material, or have I just not found the right people for it? Yes. That's such a, that's such a difficult thing. Yes, thing. I've I've definitely done that where I've had something that I truly believed in. Oh, so many times. And yet I kept going and couldn't get it to work, and, like... I'm fighting with myself. I know this line is funny mm-hmm. to me, just not to anyone else. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, and it's because like, is it just you're that's just not the right? Is it not an enthusiastic audience? Is it just the right? <sighs> yeah, it's a weird thing because like you have that one side of like this is actually a very good joke, but it's just not the right audience. And then you also have people who are like, I make my inappropriate jokes and they're not laughing. They're the problem. It's such a weird balance to find. Those guys are some of the worst, too. Oh, my God. They're some, ah. some of the bottom feeders of the comedy world mm-hmm. are the people that, my jokes are going to be my jokes, and if they don't like it, they're just too sensitive. Mm-hmm. Instead of thinking, maybe it's not funny. Yeah, maybe it's not funny. Maybe it's not funny. Maybe read the fucking room. Mm-hmm. Uh, maybe if you want to get into comedy, do it because you want to say something, not because you want to offend people. Oh, Absolutely, yeah. Like, if I offend people, it's all inadvertently. Mm-hmm. I, I no longer write things that I want to go, yeah, this is going to piss a group off. Yeah. You know, I'm not writing, like, I'm not talking shit on, like, uh, you vegans mm-hmm. or other groups that, oh, attack these people. Like, I'm not looking to bother anybody because yeah. I don't need the trouble. Yeah. It's like, what, what? And furthermore, are you telling me there's nothing interesting about anything I've lived or experienced that I can talk about mm-hmm. instead of let me find marginalized people and shit on them. Mm-hmm. I just don't get it. Yeah, I mean, in the end, my comment is too raw. I'm too, I'm too real and too raw. <laughs> you're making you're making <laughs> awkward jokes about your weird sexual experiences that nobody wants to hear about. Like, because that's that's the main thing I've noticed with a lot of people. It's like. Specifically, with, I mean, I love sex stuff. My comedy was very dirty for a long time. But, like, the thing is, if you're... The thing about most of these things, if you're going to say something inappropriate, what point are you trying to make? What, what, what's your point of view on this inappropriate thing that makes it interesting? Because just hearing a story about, like, a weird sexual encounter, that's not interesting. What, what was your point of view on it that made it weird? Because in the end, I, I'm a strong... Someone once asked me, like, how do you get funny? 
how do you become funny? And I'm like, ha ha ha, feel ugly and unlovable most of your life. Um, <laughs> That's great. <laughs> um, no, my, cause my advice is that I think everyone has, everyone has the potential to be funny. It just depends on the kind of comedy that works for them. And also it's like, what's your point of view? Like, I think there's a stereotype of like, yeah, I mean, as I joke, it's like, we've all suffered. Therefore, like, that's what makes a funny person. But in the end, it's more a point of view. Like, it isn't the things that I've been through that make me interesting. It's my point of view on the things I've been through that make me an interesting comedian. That's what, that was, that's what makes anybody interesting. Absolutely. Uh, mm -hmm. A lot of these guys also go on the uh, bandwagon of such and such said it. I mm -hmm. can say it. Without realizing they put 30 years like of work in. Like they put in. 30 to, like they put, you are a new open micer. They have like put in like all this work and they have earned the right to say, I don't agree with most, many of those things, but they've earned it. Not only they've that, earned it. They crafted it in a manner that it's at least a joke. Yeah. It's at least a joke. Okay. You could see how he got there. Uh -huh. He didn't just say, uh, and bomb. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, uh, you know, insert stereotype here. Mm -hmm. Ah, losers. Like. All right, calm down. Let's mm -hmm. let's get it together. I don't know. I just uh, and this is me going off. I just I lo I love the scene uh -huh. drama without being involved in it. Oh no, you it's like you just like it. eat the popcorn and you're like. Nom, 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 yeah, nom, nom. I'm like, oh yeah. look at these two idiots. Neither one of them knows shit about popcorn. <laughs> I mean, I don't either. Uh -huh. But yeah, I, you know what? I don't know shit, but at least I admit that I don't know it. I said the other day mm -hmm. I don't always comment on group uh, posts, but when I do, I make sure I sound like a fucking idiot because like. I think it might have been in Displaced Comedians, even. Some lady comic was complaining about her feature mm -hmm. uh, after he went up and he left. And I read the paragraph wrong. I was like, oh, he just took the money and didn't perform. And she's like, no, no, no. He just left after a set. And then I was like, oh, I read it wrong. That's not the worst thing in the world. And then felt like, oh, you just completely uh, disregarded her feelings again. Uh -huh. And then I was like, ah, no, my mistake. That's awful. Like, just stupid shit. Yeah, but in the end, I also, I, will, I also look at that like, is that frustrating? Yes, but I'm like, why would you put that in a public group? Yeah, and I mean, uh -huh. the more I think about it, like, yeah, he, he, he performed and left. Like, he didn't say goodbye. I get it. Uh -huh. uh, that's annoying, but he performed. Like, yeah. I thought he just took the money and never, like, never mm -hmm. went on stage. Yeah. I don't know. That's my reading comprehension skills are <laughs> not what they used to be. Uh -huh. I used to be a sharp seventh grader and I'm back to third grade. Um, what, what, any, any message you'd like to get out uh, to the people? Anything you'd like to say before we get out of here? Get vaccinated. Get vaccinated. Get vaccinated. Be safe. I don't know. <laughs> I, got, I got vaccinated as soon mm -hmm. as they start saying uh, you can't come to certain places. And no, yeah, like, that's. Here, I'll tell you a story after we finish the podcast because I'm not gonna shade people out, but um, <laughs> yeah, uh huh, yeah, that's that's what I did. Uh huh. Um, if you guys want to get vaxxed, I recommend it highly. Uh huh. Uh, like and, you'll be knocked up for a day, but then hey, then you get to go. Then you get to go places. Yeah. You get to see people. Yeah, and you get to do fun stuff. You have a much less chance of dying if you get COVID. Uh huh. Like, like that's the biggest benefit. To me, that's not huge. dying. Yeah. That's huge. I kind of uh -huh. want to stick around a little bit. Yeah. Like uh -huh. there's some stuff, even though we'll be the planet will be destroyed in a year by this will be my turnaround joke by climate change or aliens. 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 There we that's go. That's my through line through this podcast. Um, <laughs> we brought it all full circle. We all brought it back to the original point. Um, yeah. Like there's still some cool stuff. <laughs> there's some cool stuff to live for. <laughs> there's there's uh, French fries on everything, guys. Yeah, that's literally what I was about to say. <laughs> That like there's a bunch of fr like there's French fries. There's plenty of sandwiches with French fries to eat. <laughs> you know, it cheats when you order uh -huh. a hoagie. They allow you to add French fries to it. Oh my God. Like, isn't that <laughs> every comic here knows cheats so well? Because you know that feeling of like after a show. Like, I don't like to eat a lot before a show, but then afterwards you're like, Give me everything. <laughs> and of course, we all the comics. I think I think the true comic hangout is cheats. That's the true comedy hangout. Either if it's a really good show, uh -huh. I reward myself with a bunch of sheets. I reward myself with a bunch of stuff at sheets. If it's a bad show, I reward myself with a bunch of sheets. Yeah. 
I eat my sorrows away. I eat my I eat my happiness and I eat my sorrow. I have to earn a lot at work because my uh-huh. sheets bills get so expensive. <laughs> like if that's I, a tax write off, like all the sheets. Yeah, I go in there after a night, I get a drink, I get some uh-huh. food, I get some cigarettes. It's like thirty five dollars uh-huh. before I leave. Oh God, most of that's food too. <laughs> Shout out to sheets. Shout out to sh- the true sponsor of the Pittsburgh comedy scene. That's the truth, man. Uh-huh. Right there. They got everything. They do. I don't mean to be a, a commercial for Sheets, but they got everything. This, this podcast has been sponsored by Sheets. Actually, only. <laughs> you guys heard the sponsors. Check out Talking with Shadows. Uh, great podcast from the One Candle Society, guys. And check out MC Auto Detail, uh, which you've heard the commercial for as well by this time. Um, thank you for coming in, Miss Hopper. My Hopper. pleasure. Thank you so much for Absolute inviting me. Absolute pleasure. Uh, guys, make sure you check her out. She does phenomenal leg shaving videos from what I understand. <laughs> There's only one. There's only one. Don't uh, worry. Once you make a masterpiece, why, per, why, why, why move on? Like, you know what? I should just quit comedy now. You can't improve You'll never perfection. see me again. Yeah. yeah. Um, so check that out. Uh, great comedian. This even better human. Uh, thank you for coming on. Until next time, guys. Peace and love. Thank you so much for having me.